master plan in the most uh, specific way for our college. Uh, there have been several presentations for uh, the entire university, and um, I guess that some of you probably have already attended them, but uh, we had uh, Patrick Tedesco, who is one of the architects working uh, for the master plan, to come today and, and give this uh, specific presentation. So, first of all, I want to thank uh, Patrick for uh, uh, finding the time to do this uh, with us. And he will be talking about the, uh, the master plan. Uh, again, if you have been in some of these uh, public presentations, you might be familiar with part of what he's going to say. And we will keep the second half of this hour for uh, questions coming from, from you. So we have faculty, we have students, we have staff. So I think this could be uh, very interesting. Let me just uh, introduce Patrick. He's a principal at the architectural office NBBJ, which was formerly Channel Krieger. He's had over 20 years of professional experience as an architect, planner, and urban designer on a broad variety of public and private uh, planning and design projects. Uh, his work, however, has been focusing particularly on uh, campus uh, design and university design. So in addition to our master plan, uh, Patrick has been in charge for uh, State University of New York at Fredonia and, and Alfred Ceramics, uh, for Simmons College, for Suffolk University. He has uh, also led a variety of uh, design projects for uh, uh, also Inamori School of Engineering at uh, the State University of New York at Alfred, a new campus for the Engineering University of Karama in the northwest uh, part of China. His uh, experience also includes other campus designs, like for uh, the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, uh, UMass Boston, Brandeis University, and the master plan for graduate housing for Harvard University in the Riverside neighborhood of Cambridge. He also served as project manager for the design and construction of Blackstone Hall and the Dolan Field House at Clark University, and several renovations for uh, Harvard's uh, Holyoke Center. He earned a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Notre Dame and a Master's of Architecture in Urban Design from the uh, Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design. He currently serves as the Commissioner of, of Urban Design on the Boston Society of Architects Board of Directors and is a frequent guest juror at the number of architectural schools in New England. So please let me welcome you. I wish I had sent a shorter bio. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm very uh, pleased to be here to share with you uh, some of the work we've been doing over the last year or so. Uh, I will say that this is, this is sort of an unsanctioned master plan presentation. This is really and uh, for us, an opportunity as professionals to share with students at CAMD what we've been up to. I know many of you are curious to, to understand what, how the master plan affects CAMD in particular, but I, what I really wanted to focus on was kind of the overall framework of the plan and, and also to share for students in particular some of the tools we use and some of the methodology. I'll start with the mission, which is always a good place to start a master plan. This is really about a focus on academics, first and foremost. This is about helping Northeastern achieve its mission of becoming a major research university, uh, building predominantly academic space, fostering interdisciplinary connections, which I think CAMD is sort of the, the poster child for and, and should continue in the future. So this is really about academic space. Not to say that other uh, space like student experience, <laughs> student life is not critically important, and I think for CAMD, uh, performance space, rehearsal space is as much an academic priority as it is a student life priority and experience a priority for the university. We also want to focus, of course, on improving the physical campus. How do we uh, better integrate Northeastern to its community, although it's a, it's a pretty, pretty well-integrated urban campus, and we want to improve on that even more. Uh, we want to create a vibrant uh, campus, both at the core and at its urban edges. And a big <coughs> focus of the master plan, as you'll see, is continuing the growth across the tracks toward Roxbury, uh, which, which, of course, involves infrastructure as much as it does uh, programs and buildings. So we're going to show some examples of that as well. We always start with this amazing transformation because it was actually not that long ago that Northeastern looked uh, quite different than it does today, as did its, its context. And actually, you know, 20 years later, it was not that much different. And so uh, we moved 40 years ahead to color and, and a kind of remarkable campus. Uh, and it's a reminder of what, uh, what's been accomplished at Northeastern. It's a reminder of what good planning can do. And if you just look back 10 years, 10 or 12 years, uh, many of you are, have been here long enough to remember when West Village was still parking lots, and everything in red was been, has been built under the last master plan for Northeastern, which is an amazing accomplishment. 
uh, three million, close to two and a half million square feet, most of it housing. Um, and of course, not to be forgotten, of course, West Village everyone focuses on, but a great deal of investment in Columbus Avenue as well. And uh, if you think about those two initiatives, really framing the future of the campus, particularly toward Columbus, and these sort of outliers uh, representing the fact that Northeastern is kind of built out. There's not a whole lot of room left to grow, which has led Northeastern to leasing space at Christian Science, leasing space at 140 the Fenway. Of course, the great uh, acquisition of the, the Fenway Center has been a terrific boom. But the transformation of the university, just in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, space, in terms of uh, the campus, uh, has been remarkable. And there's no reason to think that the next 10 or 12 years can't be a similarly uh, kind of uh, memorable transformation. And of course, not just about buildings, but the campus and the landscape. And this is really where we think the future focus will be, Columbus Avenue, um, which is already a much improved street than it was a decade ago, uh, thanks to Northeastern's presence, and uh, we expect it will continue. So from an urban design standpoint, there's a great opportunity not only to think about the campus, but to think about the city building opportunities that the plan brings. And of course, uh, again, the collection of, of sort of outlying buildings, but nonetheless, uh, even though they're leased facilities, uh, certainly great facilities, and, a, and a, an emphasis on how much space Northeastern is really uh, in need of, particularly from an academic standpoint. So uh, just a few kind of diagrams to frame the approach of the master plan. Um, Huntington Avenue, uh, the historic uh, street, the historic front door of Northeastern. Uh, it's changed a lot uh, since Northeastern occupied it uh, in the 1940s. Uh, in some ways, the university may have turned its back on Huntington for a while, and now I think there's an opportunity for this master plan to, to sort of refocus uh, Northeastern's presence on Huntington. And of course, as I mentioned, a future front door on the other side of the tracks, which we hope will not seem like the other side of the tracks a decade from now, Columbus Avenue. The connections between Huntington and Columbus are important. They're, of course, challenged by the tracks. Um, but we think that there's opportunities to improve that, and also, really with the West Village, this great kind of uh, array of open space, which has been, I think over time, has evolved into a nice network. And uh, kind of a quick look into the future, we call this the, uh, the East-West Necklace, but there's an opportunity for some future interventions that we're gonna share to complete that necklace and to complete what is really a sequence of open space and pedestrian circulation, and also to improve uh, crossings uh, over the tracks. Uh, we love this, I wanted to do this especially for the architects and the urban designers, uh, the Noli map of, uh, of Northeastern, which is still in progress. But what we did is we wanted to map kind of assembly spaces, uh, public assembly and predominantly student life spaces. And some of the things we learned from this is the kind of lack <laughs> of such space in zones like this along Forsyth Avenue. And yet Forsyth is one of the most important uh, corridors of the campus. Uh, with not a whole lot of front doors, not a whole lot of student space, not a whole lot of public space along the street. Uh, so just the kind of mapping, the only mapping of the existing campus uh, tells us a lot about, way, about areas that we want to focus on. So what I'm going to do is quickly run through, um, within the framework of that analysis I just shared, quickly run through some initiatives. Now, this is a very, very ambitious plan. Uh, do not mistake this for what Northeastern will do in the next 10 years. This is probably more likely a 15 or 20 year vision, uh, but certainly within this plan there are a number of initiatives predominantly focused on academic space uh, that the university is interested in, in pursuing. Uh, this is sort of the, the overall future vision of the campus, and, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Um, our methodology as campus planners is to be architectural. We don't want to simply identify sites and massing. We try to image uh, our campus plans uh, in an architectural way so that people can understand possibility and that we can actually think in a very intentional way about design even at a planning level. So here's the, the kind of three, three million square feet plus or minus uh, that's, that's considered. Um, some quick fly-throughs, uh, rider hall. What we're looking at are opportunity sites, underutilized buildings, and not that the rider hall is underutilized, I don't want to suggest that, but the parking lot behind it uh, maybe an opportunity to expand Rider, uh, maybe an opportunity to be combined with a redevelopment of Rider over time, but certainly things like surface lots and uh, older buildings like Foresight are some of the sites that we're looking at. That kind of strange collection of buildings that's made up by Cargill and Stearns and Cariotis, perhaps this could be assembled uh, to create a, a better development opportunity and, and space to Huntington Avenue. Uh, the Foresight building, 
uh, a useful building on campus, but not quite the highest and best use for that site, perhaps. Very prominent location on Forsyth Street. This is also an opportunity. Another infill project, the North Lot, uh, back in the Fenway neighborhood. Uh, you can see we have great plans for all the surface parking that exists on the campus, and don't ask me where all those cars go. Um, but uh, certainly the opportunity is to think about, uh, again, reusing sites that are not particularly well utilized, not only because they're great opportunities, but they contribute to campus building. The Science Quad, Ugar, Hertig, and Robinson, small buildings, older facilities that have a lot of demand given the sciences, and when combined with Cullinane uh, adjacent to it, there may be an opportunity to reconsider a new Science Quad in the future. The Matthews building, uh, the Matthews Arena, I should say, has been looked at as an addition. Uh, the parking lot in front of Matthews presents opportunities for athletics. And then, perhaps a longer term initiative, the Gainsborough Garage has been thought of as a future home for athletics uh, and the future home for a building to replace uh, the Cabot Cage and the Cabot uh, Gym, which really opens up long term a tremendous opportunity for Northeastern to create a new uh, porous building, a front door uh, on Huntington Avenue, and certainly an opportunity to contribute to the Avenue of the Arts, which I know is of great interest uh, to this college. So just a few images, uh, the possible massing studies for a building behind Ryder. This has been looked at maybe as student housing on top of an academic base, like West Village H, recognizing that if something like this happened, Ryder would have to be really kind of reconceived and perhaps redeveloped altogether. Uh, so that's, that's a, certainly an opportunity, but uh, we think Ryder, as useful as it is, may uh, perhaps be a site for a, a more prominent building and a more prominent presence on the quad. Again, the north lot and the Fenway, just a simple little study to think about an infill building, perhaps a general academic building that could be swing space for future renovations. I mentioned the science quad. Uh, this is a building that sits on the Robinson uh, footprint and could <coughs> perhaps be combined with a track crossing. And also, another approach that we've looked at uh, is to think about um, kind of taking over Robinson, connecting to Hertig, uh, linking back to Mugar so that you have sort of an integrated science complex in the future. And perhaps uh, the Cullinane site might actually give way to open space. Uh, if, we, if we consider the, the future uh, Grandmark building, which is now under construction right across the street from Cullinane, a building of that scale might want some relief in terms of open space. But this, this is going to be a very important part of the campus in the future. Right now, it's kind of a back door. But uh, St. Patolf Street, uh, with, the, with the Grandmark building and with some of the proposals for Gainsborough Garage and, and Matthews, will be a very important corridor in the future. Uh, so a word or two about Matthews. This is kind of an exciting opportunity. Um, obviously, a great old arena. Um, but some of the amenities that are lacking might be suited by an addition on the front and perhaps a liner that wraps down um, St. Patolf Street. Uh, the thinking is that this may be a facility for varsity basketball. This might be an opportunity for uh, Northeastern to have a practice facility uh, to improve its recruiting capabilities for athletics, but also uh, you know, the, the kind of recentering of athletics on this part of the campus. Uh, this would connect to Matthews, but it would kind of leave the historic structure alone, but provide you know, opportunities for uh, support space for Matthews because it is such an old facility. Uh, just a, an image looking down uh, St. Patolf Street. Uh, here's the Gainsborough Garage. This is the New England Conservatory. They also have major plans for this intersection. So the feeling is, is in a decade or so, this could be a very, very different part of the city, a very, very different part of the campus. Uh, the Gainsborough Garage, as I mentioned, um, a big enough site to accommodate uh, an athletic facility, a student recreation facility. And if you think about the proximity of these two buildings and the importance of uh, the T the station at, at Mass Ave and the opportunity to create a new crossing, maybe a new entrance to the T station uh, to bridge over the tracks to connect to Columbus, it could be a, a very, very different environment and really the future center of athletics and recreation for Northeastern. So this is just kind of a massing study looking down a Gainsborough across the tracks um, and sort of a cutaway that shows uh, the ability to accommodate sort of stacked long span uh, for uh, athletics on the Cabot site, I'm sorry, on the Gainsborough site. Uh, and then a look down uh, Gainsborough Street uh, at this prominent corner and a great kind of architectural opportunity, a great branding opportunity uh, for the university. Another uh, project which is being considered in partnership with the city of Boston, and again, this relates to 
the recentering of athletics in this part of the campus. This is the Carter Playground. Northeastern owns the parking lot, the Camden lot, uh, and there's been interest in combining those two properties, uh, still remaining a public park, a public facility, but what it would allow is a, an extra field uh, that would be of, of great use to the community and, and certainly of, of great use to Northeastern as well. But the idea is to kind of improve this, make it a synthetic field, a, a turf field that will get a lot better utilization and create a, a really strong presence on what is a historic public space, but one that has not been particularly well maintained uh, over time. So this is, this is sort of related to the notion of, of shifting athletics uh, over to this part of the campus. Now, long term, it's not just about <coughs> athletics. What this does is presents an opportunity, a great opportunity for the Cabot site. And as an architect, I admire this building greatly. I think a lot of us do. Um, but it, is it really the best use for the site? Is it, is it perhaps outlived its usefulness? as a facility? Uh, could a building here do what the Marino Center did for Huntington Avenue, which is to activate uh, the street? And so we've thought about uh, just conceptually, this is a major mixed use facility in the future, academic space, possibly housing, uh, but certainly an opportunity for, for the arts on Huntington Avenue. And, and really, Northeastern's opportunity to, to be an active uh, participant in the Avenue of the Arts. Um, just a kind of a night rendering uh, view looking at, at this site. It's an enormous site that can accommodate a lot, over half a million square feet potentially. And if you think about the opportunity to combine that with the foresight redevelopment, uh, presents even greater flexibility. Uh, I mentioned the kind of assembly of, of these odd, odd buildings at this part of the campus. Uh, so another you know kind of uh, study that suggests the density uh, for an academic building on, on the Cargill uh, site, and again, transparency at the facade of Huntington Avenue, uh, either for the arts or for student life or for other uses, uh, but certainly another great new front door uh, for the university. Now, I'm gonna conclude uh, the sort of projects um, piece of the, of the presentation on the Columbus Lot because most of what you saw just now is, is our longer term initiatives, uh, not, not exclusively, but it's clear that the priorities for the university in the near term involve the creation of research space and interdisciplinary space, particularly for the sciences. So um, there is an initiative moving forward uh, to begin uh, redevelopment, a phase one redevelopment of the Columbus lot uh, for an interdisciplinary uh, facility. And we've sort of master planned this site in a way. We've thought about locations for incorporating two new crossings over the tracks. Uh, we've done that intentionally with consideration for how uh, current uh, paths of the campus operate and how this can sort of serve as a nexus for a lot of a lot of circulation that already happens. Uh, this of course is an important crossing now. Uh, but we think that over time a multiple phase development on the Columbus parking lot um, not only provides much needed academic space but would contribute to the Columbus Avenue presence uh, as well as the, the bridging of the tracks. And these were some early massing studies. Our, our first instinct was to think about a great kind of quad that rolled out uh, toward Columbus Avenue, not unlike Krenzman Quad does to Huntington, perhaps grafting an addition on the back of the, the library, bridging the quad over the tracks, and then thinking about development over time. Uh, we've sort of reconsidered this a little bit. It's still a, it's still a compelling idea, we think, and a compelling image. But um, you know, integrating this to the library, uh, the expensive decking of open space over the tracks, and the need to try to do something a bit more plausible and something that can be implemented in the shorter term, we, decided, we sort of turned our focus more toward uh, still an open space on Columbus Avenue, one that would be ringed by academic buildings, research buildings, uh, and perhaps student life as well, um, but a kind of mixed-use quadrangle or, or precinct, if you will, uh, really making a gesture toward Columbus Avenue, toward Roxbury, not unlike the Kretzmann Quad uh, does toward Huntington and Fenway. So um, these are just some notions of our, our landscape architects thinking about how this open space might be programmed. What I can tell you is that the likelihood of, of how this unveils and unrolls will be very different. This was sort of the master plan image, the master plan idea. Uh, the architects that are, are gonna start working on the first phase of this building uh, will have similar notions, but this will look probably quite different. Uh, but the intention is to kind of anchor um, the future growth on Columbus uh, with a first phase building of uh, primarily of science, engineering, 
uh, interdisciplinary research space, but one that will really kind of, um, uh, we think, in the short term and over the long term, begin to continue the transformation of Columbus Avenue and, of course, that important bridging of, of what's a very significant gap through the campus. So again, that's sort of the, the long-term vision uh, for all of these, uh, these projects. Uh, some notion and thought has been given to student housing. It's not the priority of the master plan, but there certainly is as a commitment uh, for Northeastern to continue to build some on-campus housing uh, in the various sites, again, combined with academic space. But the emphasis and the real need uh, is clearly on academics. Um, I'm going to kind of conclude with a few diagrams because I also wanted to remind the students that part of the discipline of campus planning for us um, involves a lot of expertise. So as architects, as urban designers, as planners, uh, but we also work with, with landscape architects, in this case our own uh, landscape architects from MDBJ who have done this sort of this great analysis of the history of the campus. Uh, we're also working with Bruce Mao Design on uh, graphics, uh, sort of environmental graphics and wayfinding for the campus. I wanted to share just a few images, uh, some concepts that the landscape architects have developed about uh, taking the kind of vibrancy of Centennial Quad and extending it toward the Ruggles drop-off, which feels very much like a vehicular environment, even though thousands of students cross it each day. So we're looking very carefully at this plaza, uh, which still has to accommodate uh, turnaround. We're looking very carefully at Forsyth Street, which has to remain a public street. But we're thinking about ways to, to in introduce traffic calming, to make it uh, a greener corridor, uh, to think about higher performance um, landscapes uh, that can accommodate stormwater. We're also looking at some very, very specific infill pockets of landscape. This is the space behind Churchill Hall. And in spite of this being kind of loading docks behind Forsyth, lots of, lots of students, lots of you pass through here every day. So there's some notion to think about uh, the pockets of interstitial space between buildings and how the, the kind of pedestrian landscape can be improved. This is actually what Northeastern has done very successfully over the last or 15 years throughout the campus. So there's still some spots that we think um, need some attention, and this is just a thought about maybe creating an outdoor uh, sort of seating environment for the cafe in the basement of Churchill. So as much as we're thinking about grander <coughs> long-term schemes, we're also thinking about very specific near-term interventions that can continue to improve the campus. I mentioned uh, Forsyth Street. Again, thinking about it as more of a pedestrian environment. Uh, thinking about introducing uh, innovative stormwater uh, techniques like this in conjunction with the vehicular way, um, bike paths, those sorts of things. Forsyth, we feel, ought to seem less like a street in the future, even though it still needs to accommodate uh, vehicles. So again, I'm jumping around a bit, but we also wanted to kind of dive into the scale. We look at existing buildings. This was an early idea about kind of uh, changing radically the, the relationship of the buildings that sit on the Huntsman Quad. Uh, perhaps ringing it with this great arcade. Um, again, still a compelling image. We haven't quite figured out how to implement this one yet, but it's something that, uh, not unlike the addition to uh, Doxer Hall at the law school, these kinds of interventions can really change the, the kind of historic core of the Northeastern architecture. I'm going to conclude with um, sort of some branding that's also been part of this master plan. I mentioned Bruce Mao Design. Uh, they've been kind of uh, doing some really innovative things, thinking about the messaging of the university, and thinking about how the campus master plan itself can be an expression of the Northeastern brand. So uh, the word transformative is a word we use a lot. It's a word that, that Northeastern uses a lot. Um, and so some of the themes that have come out of their discovery are starting to influence some thoughts about uh, campus intervention. So this, this also influences kind of a graphic identity, uh, which the university also thinks a lot about. Uh, and you know, just some kind of um, potentially uh, uh, easily <laughs> implementable interventions like crosswalks on Forsyth, Forsyth and how they can be used um, for certain messaging, how they can be used kind of in, in, in creative ways. Um, uh, something perhaps a bit more bold, I showed you the Matthews site uh, earlier, but perhaps it can become more of a, of a signboard in the future, either promoting athletics or promoting, uh, who knows, uh, other things happening at the university. Um, and, uh, you know, something, uh, a facade that, that you're all familiar with, right, the Ruggles facade. This is, uh, you know, kind of shocking at first, but the idea that perhaps there could be a, a fascia with an electronic signboard 
Um, I was going to change this to say Huskies with bean pot, which uh, we hope we can say in a week or two. But um, you know, the idea that messaging, electronic uh, media, and just kind of a graphic expression on parts of the campus that are, you know, not going to go away. The Ruggles facade is going to be there for a long time. Uh, can it be kind of more of a of a participant in in uh, the campus environment? Again, this is public space. It's owned by the MBTA, but Northeastern could well kind of consider. Uh, branding it could consider using it in a way that's sort of innovative and creative. So uh, we like having uh, other disciplines um, like graphic designers on our team because they kind of probe uh, within the master plan things like this. So it's not just about where can we fit the next uh, research building, but how can we actually improve the physical environment on the campus. So I'm going to end here where the journey begins and uh, hopefully uh, turn it over to uh, questions and comments. Before we, we start uh, the, the questions, uh, could you say something about the timing of this process? Uh, yeah, so th there's, um, I neglected to mention this because it's not as interesting, but there's a very intense public process that goes along with this master plan. The city of Boston requires that we, uh, on behalf of Northeastern, file an institutional master plan which is good for 10 years. So Northeastern's old IMP is expiring. Uh, so we're in the midst of the public process, um, the draft project notification form has been submitted. So the public process will continue uh, through the spring into the summer. Uh, at some point it will sort of dovetail and overlap with the process for the, for the building of the Columbus parking lot. Um, internally, I think the, the master plan process will follow that. So I, I think the expectation is sometime in late spring or early summer will be more or less complete. Um, but again, depending on how the public process goes, that might be some as I mentioned earlier, this, this is not a, it's a 10-year master plan as far as the city's concerned, but this is not a 10-year you know, vision. It's really looking out beyond. But it, it, it does give the university flexibility uh, to decide where, where it wants to develop in the future. Thanks. So, any questions for uh, Patrick? Thank you. A really terrific presentation. I just wanted to get back a little bit more about some of the issues in the town is about crossing the tracks general, um, related to the Columbus site in particular, but just as how you're thinking about that, you mentioned a number of times that is a, obviously a significant barrier, but. It, well, it's, it's a it's an engineering challenge, it's a physical challenge. Obviously getting up and over and back down is, is one of the biggest challenges. Um, what, what we're looking at, and what I, I think the architects um, for the Columbus building are also looking at, are ways to make it feel less like you climb a set of stairs, cross a bridge, and come down. So there are ways to kind of taper and gradually have the have you descend and ascend so that it feels more natural, so that you're not just going up and down the stairs as you do now. I think the other challenge is to make them feel less just like bridges and to widen them so that they become more like spaces. So, you know, there's cost involved in that, but um, but we've we've sort of uh, advocated for an, an approach that the bridge is a space, it's a place that you can pause, you can occupy, there's a landscape potentially. Um, the other opportunity is you get to the north side of the campus is to actually connect it to an upper level. So linking to the library, for example, on either side is one notion. Um, as you get to the Columbus side, the buildings proposed for that site will also I think, provide opportunities for you to sort of enter at the second level. So you're not doing as you do now, sort of going upstairs and down or cutting through the parking garage, that it just feels like a more graceful process. Are there any reasons why you can't actually put enclosed space by building to an upper level? Uh, that's another opportunity. We, you, you actually can, and that's that's something I think, from both a security standpoint and a comfort standpoint, is also I think something we want to explore. I mean, there are costs involved. The TD, you know, there's air rights. The more you, the more space you have to cross it, the more it costs. But I think um, at least one of the crossings would be great if it's actually in Columbus. It'd be great if you could imagine a sort of 24-hour campus where people would, you know, cross the tracks between buildings. I, I you know, I showed Ruggles facade, but the Ruggles station itself is probably the most successful crossing and the one that is certainly after hours gets you from one end of the National Village and to the other end. So um, I think that um, that idea, you know, it's not a heated space, but it's a close space and it can become a great space. So that's a good idea. Look, 
couldn't you put something like a cafe on it, seriously? Because it's so cold, so much of our academic years here that a park or even just an unheated enclosure would be the best option. It's, it's, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I think one of one of the longer, really long-term ideas is that as you put more crossings over time, there's no reason why you can't literally deck between them mm -hmm. so that you're you're kind of making the bridges go away and creating open space. Um, it did seem to us that, and that's why we kind of moved away from our initial idea because the the infrastructure cost, you know, weighed against the, the resources for the buildings themselves. There's a priority issue, so we want to do a successful crossing. Of a crossing that people are encouraged to use, but over time there's no reason why the, the, the orange line gap can't kind of begin to dissolve and, and go away altogether. Other questions? Hi, um, I was really interested in your plans for art and sort of um, interventions in public spaces, and I was wondering if you considered um, expanding it maybe to a huge body, just for like more inclusive spaces to see what they're interested in. Well, we actually have had a couple focus groups um, with uh, undergraduates and graduates, and a, a lot of there's a lot of work that the Bruce Mountain did. A lot of messaging that came out of those sessions. Um, so they were really trying to get into the students' uh, minds and how they thought about the space and how they were relating to the space. <coughs> and it was it was a great it was a great experience, and I think um, it really informed some of the thinking. So certainly more of that. Yeah. We're the College of Art, Media, and Design. Could you tell us where we'll be and how we fit in? And I, I, I can't, only because w the intention for this plan was to not sort of assign space for the colleges. Uh, it was really to think about opportunities and flexibility. What, what I can tell you is that um, the presence of CAMD on Centennial Quad uh, is sort of a, an acknowledged importance, uh, and the opportunity for Ryder to grow, uh, either as an addition or a redevelopment, you know, would certainly benefit CAMD. And the other, the other idea, or I should say, not not mutually exclusive, but United Realty, which some people think we should just demolish altogether. But over time, as that building gets de-densified and you can actually do a substantive renovation and gut that building. You have to forgive me. I don't know what the United Realty. I'm sorry. It's it's uh, Missouri and Nightingale okay. and Lake and that, that yeah. complex across the quad. Um, you know, that would make uh, a sort of great studio building if it were really kind of de-densified in a way. Um, there's also <laughs> an opportunity to, to kind of put a liner, a new addition on the quad side um, that would also kind of change the backside of the building and give it more of a public face. So without saying, you know, the colleges are going to be here and there, there's certainly an acknowledgement that CAMD needs more space, it needs more studio space, it needs more rehearsal space, it needs performance space. So Centennial Quad, and then I think over time, as, as the arts are perhaps uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, explored further on Huntington, great opportunity for CAMD as well. Thank you. I have a, well, actually, I have a difficult question for you, which has to do with identity. I don't know if there's one. Certainly, Krenzman, uh, uh, Krenzman is maybe the most signature space from a student's perspective. Centennial, I'm sorry, Krenzman is the sort of historic iconic space of the university, right? Maybe the original photo op, if you will. Centennial has become, I think, the hub of sort of outdoor campus life in many ways. There's no reason that the Columbus space, whatever that is, uh, could not be the, the sort of future there's, there's certainly not a desire to mimic the glazed brick buildings, and there's not a desire to necessarily, you know, kind of continue in the vein of, of uh, West Village. Although West Village, I think, did a pretty good job of being fairly eclectic in its, in its uh, architecture. There's not a kind of signature style. So, 
Um, those are good questions. I think the university you know, is thinking about that. Um, I don't know if there's one space. Um, I would say it's the city. I would say it's actually Northeastern's relationship to Boston that is the most kind of iconic opportunity. So the edges, that's why we come back to the graphics, for example, to show as a kind of way to make, it, uh, make people clear that the urban type of age sure. is connected. Right. It, it, but there's definitely not a desire to, to make gates. Or, or, you know, Northeastern is, is a porous campus, right? And, and everything we try to do uh, only tries to reinforce that and make it even more porous, which is why the crossings are important, because you know, instead of having to go around the campus, you have to more connections. But um, you know, it's, a, it's a great question. I think uh, time will tell. <laughs> I think uh, related to Ivan's question is the focus that you put on uh, Forsyth Avenue in particular, and, and viewing that as a new kind of uh, center of gravity point within the campus, because once the camp once the campus expanded to Web Campus, Krenzman Quad then almost seems peripheral, and you can kind of see that when you're just looking at the uh, the aerial view that you have here. And Forsyth actually occupies a prominent uh, position, let's say, dimensionally and also culturally, because there's so much activity there, and I think the recognition of that as a major opportunity for redevelopment, not only the kind of urban landscape, but the redevelopment of the buildings that uh, define that space, I think is uh, you know, a fantastic uh, move. Yeah, I mean, Forsyth does feel like a division, even though it's, it's crossed you know, quite a bit. So making it feel less like a division, but also acknowledging that it is, it is a city of Boston street that will continue to be so. There will be you know, uh, LMA shuttle buses running up and down, picking people up at Ruggles. There will be you know, service vehicles delivering. So how to negotiate that and make it feel campus-like. But you know, back to the question of why not tear down the United Realty Complex. The fact that it's an old piece of fabric, that it's a piece of the city and, and the street that runs behind it, is kind of a you know a recollection of the fact that it was a city street, it is a city street. But the you know foresight, the kind of uh, back side of the cabin, you know, which is you know, not so friendly, that could be a very very different street edge in the future. And I would also point out that the intersection of foresight and Huntington, which I think is fairly successful on the Marino side, is sort of. I think the, the campus side is uh, less so. So that's another area that we're kind of focusing on a bit. Um, and even some you know, short-term <coughs> interventions on the Cabot facade, because the Cabot's not going to go away tomorrow. So how do you, in, in the interim, kind of rebrand Cabot and make it more interesting? <coughs> uh, two quick things. Does, <coughs> excuse me, the master plan deal only with exterior spaces, or do you also get into interior spaces? Um, mostly with exterior space, although there are some um, interventions that we're looking at uh, slightly more detail. Um, you know, how to sort of better communicate spaces through the student center, for example. We, we think about the way students pass through buildings, the way, you know, the exterior campus circulation kind of becomes interior at times, but we've not focused um, really intently on that. There's a whole, there was a whole programming uh, exercise at the beginning of this that tried to identify need. And in doing that, we did some evaluations of existing spaces. Um, well, as a teacher, just let me put in a plea for, uh, please talk to the teachers before you design the interior spaces. So many of the classrooms on this campus are just abysmal yeah. from a teaching, from a pedagogical standpoint to the point where it affects the quality of instruction. The second question that I had was, um, is there any um, plan to expand the, the underground system as well? Well, that's come up. It's a challenge, and back to Foresight, the, the stony, Creek uh, storm system runs right under Foresight, which is why mm. the tunnel system was not extended to the West Village. Uh, and extending under the tracks is, is not plausible either. So I think uh, certainly as Columbus builds out in phases, the intention is to try to lift those buildings up and have sort of connected service on Columbus. Um, but there hasn't really been a, you know, a sort of meaningful look at expanding the underground uh, too much. Uh, but one more word on classrooms. As a master planning principle, we identified from the very beginning just what you said, that teaching spaces are, are a major um, need on the campus, not only quantity, but quality. So we're not designing classrooms, but we've done a whole analysis that kind of looks at right sizing of teaching spaces and, and promotes spaces that would encourage more contemporary pedagogies and so forth. So as a general principle, 
classrooms are definitely identified as a big part of that. So if you ever need like a, a war-torn veteran here to, uh, <laughs> to, to give you some uh, thoughts, I would be very happy. What are they? You know, actually, I think the university has done a pretty good job of making that service alley, in some cases, feel like it's an okay place to be. I mean, a lot of people do walk back and forth. Uh, our initial um, instinct of lining the, the back of the library with something that was based on the Columbus and the Virginia Cross, um, that becomes a bit more challenging when you, you know, by building around um, the Columbus lot, you know, we're kind of, in some ways, reinforcing that as the back of the campus. So that's imperfect. Um, uh, I think that the, the redevelopment of Robinson and Hertig on the science uh, quad do present an opportunity for additional space. Uh, I think the redevelopment of Gainsborough Garage, the intention is to create sort of a, an upper deck that at least sets up the ability to bridge across and, and creates more of a face toward Columbus. Um, but hopefully something more than just putting you know, Northeastern University on the side of buildings, uh, which was sort of a you know, way of letting people know that they were facing Roxbury. I think um, it's something that, as that scene on the campus redevelops over time, you know, ought to try to, to address it. <coughs> along those lines, you mentioned redeveloping almost every building on campus, and you still have to have a library is really a hub for student life, student activity, study, all these student spaces, and I feel like that's one of our more, as a student, probably my opinion, that's very antiquated space, yeah. it's not everyone's favorite place, that won't be studied at all, but learn style is going to be part of the master plan, like there actually are some initiatives going on. I think CNMB might be involved in the digital media commons, and I know that that was that was sort of the, the major initiative that was underway, which we certainly would, would uh, reinforce. But we heard a lot about the library. It, it is in a process of kind of like a lot of university libraries changing its its uh, position, right? It's getting fewer volumes, uh, more study space. Uh, so I think some of the activities that happen around it and some of the bridge connections. That's about as far as we went with the library, but it does try to acknowledge its importance, you know, as a hub, physically and programmatically. Um, but you know, we, we didn't propose any particular interventions in the library. But in general, another master plan kind of principle is that all buildings, all academic buildings, need to have space like that that serve spaces for group study, uh, that become hubs within the buildings themselves. So it becomes sort of a distributed model as opposed to, you know, building a bigger library. Uh, it's more about distributing those kinds of activities across the nation. Sarah? Yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to follow up on your answer to Peter, and you were talking about the intersection of 417 and you felt that it was successful on the north side of the street. But what people who are taking the teaching the MFA see is people on elliptical trainers, they see an oval pan, and they cross the street, and they see a Cordova. And that's an odd presence, I think, to have on the Avenue of Arts. So I was wondering why you didn't really think, or you know, are you thinking about something to do with that space? It's so visible. I, I should have excluded Qdoba from my <laughs> comment about that side being successful. Um, it, you know, that's not a property the university owns, and I think um, you know th this is a master plan that tries to focus on Northeastern's footprint. It actually is not an expansive okay. view. Now, per, you know, perimeter properties that Northeastern does not own right. are always kind of you know in the sphere of interest. And Northeastern gets approached a lot by landowners and so forth, but mm -hmm. we didn't really kind of uh, identify acquisition sites, and there really aren't any in this master plan. But mm -hmm. um, it is we, we do own the dorm adjacent, right? Um, yes, you do own the building <coughs> adjacent to that. That's right. Um, so I, I think it's uh, yeah. I mean, we're not doing a, a kind of property by property evaluation, but uh, we do think there's a lot of room for improvement on the south side of. Um, as, as somebody in, in this college, and I think all of us have an interest, we, we do feel a kind of ironic that the least thing visible on the Avenue of the Arts is the arts. The arts. Right. Northeastern predated the Avenue of the Arts in a way, so it's, it's an opportunity. To, even though Northeastern has done an awful lot to, to improve Huntington, uh, both in terms of just streetscape improvements, and obviously it's a major contributor. I know the Fenway Alliance 
would agree that the Northeastern is a major contributor to the Huntington improvement. So programmatically and uh, culturally, I think there's, there's an opportunity to engage as well. Thank you. Thank you. There, yeah, there's a lot of stuff which I didn't share related to stormwater management. And, and Forsyth is also, and, and actually back to your question about the Tito's intersection. One, one idea is to actually uh, narrow Forsyth to the north side of, of Huntington because it actually gets quite wide. And the idea that it can become a, a connector to the Fenway and serve as this kind of literal and, and kind of symbolic connector between Southwest Corridor Park and the Fenway, so two very important urban uh, park systems in Boston. And then the campus can kind of do that uh, in our south. So there's a, there's a large reduction in impervious surface that's been proposed here. Um, and there's certainly a, a kind of ethos around the stormwater management, uh, which, you know, <coughs> this campus is also in the groundwater overlay district, which has lots of restrictions. So a lot of, from a regulatory standpoint, the university has a few spots. Um, the landscape architect on the team has done a lot of thinking about that with those engineers. And there's sort of things I didn't share with the other stuff. graduate student enrollment, uh, but not undergraduate student enrollment. That, that's uh, projected to remain. Um, so you said at the beginning of your talk that one of the motivators was a focus on interdisciplinary research and education. Uh, and then at the end, you mentioned that there's this plan to build up interdisciplinary in the sciences and engineering. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how this desire to focus on interdisciplinary guided sort of the overall at all? Well, uh, good question. I think in some ways it guided it in the sense that we're not saying this is CAMD, this is CSSH, this is COE. So the idea, it sort of gave us some liberty to, to plan outside of the, the boundaries of the colleges, right? And that was something that was very clear from the beginning. This is not about, you know, finding a home for the business school. Uh, it, it's actually about opportunities that I think, um, you know, raise questions, raise logical questions about well, this gee, this might be a good site uh, for CCIS and CAMD to kind of overlap a little bit. Uh, programmatically, when we developed the, the, the needs analysis for the campus, uh, there was a lot of space. Uh, most of the space came from the needs of the, of the individual colleges, but then there was a lot of space that was kind of in, in put into the program that was just literally designed for clusters of interdisciplinary. So it did not belong to one college or the other. So programmatically, in the, the ambition of the master plan, there's space considered for that. Um, but I, I would say it just gave us liberty to, to plan without thinking about who owns what, I think, which is, which is sometimes a good thing. And I guess as a quick follow-up, it does feel like, I'm, I know I'm relatively new to the campus, but as I move around the space, it does feel like, like when I'm in the West Village, that feels like sort of very CCIS-controlled space, and Peniel Common feels more like maybe in design, and then it goes over to engineering. And sort of as it is right now, the space is very clustered by college. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one thing that I really liked was talking about sort of building paths to be able to move between them better. And so maybe something something like that feels like if it, if it didn't feel like I was walking down the service alley to get from uh, media and design to CCIS, that would that would feel nice. <laughs> sure. No, and, and you're right. The campus now is sort of a function of, and, and I know the colleges were reshuffled this year yeah. too. So. Um, you know, there, there is naturally, you're in the science quad, you, you're sort of surrounded by the College of Science. But, yeah. you know, Bouvet um, is, a, is a good example of a college that's very distributed um, and, you know, be even more distributed with, with um, you know, Columbus a lot. I think right. all of our conversations with the deans, they felt that that was a good thing, right? That, that kind of helped foster these connections. I mean, it's still an untested theory or an unproven theory if true interdisciplinary activities can happen everywhere. I mean, you know, they, they can't always, but you know, that's certainly the goal. I have a, a question. You, you mentioned uh, this development that the New England Conservatory is uh, contemplating, and I was wondering with these important institutions uh, sharing the campus, like the Museum of Fine Arts, the New England Conservatory, and possibly others, uh, what kind of coordination 
Is that what we're looking at? Um, well, a fair amount. Uh, we, you know, New England Conservatory was out in front of Northeastern in their, their planning process. They actually got approval for their IMP. So, um, but the Boston Redevelopment Authority is also, you know, strongly encourages those kinds of interactions. So we've met with New England Conservatory. Actually, they sit on the community task force for the master plan. Uh, they shared with us their plan. It certainly influenced the way we thought about the other side of, of uh, Gainsborough Street and San Francisco. Uh, Wentworth. Um, you know, has the master plan that's now been approved that proposes development on Sweeney Field. And um, that's something that, that Northeastern has considered as well. Uh, so yeah, the other institutions um, are, are certainly partners and neighbors. Not, not the, the NFA, we haven't really sat down with so much, but um, uh, it, 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 there are opportunities. I mean, ideally, institutions kind of are in full cooperation with one another, they are not always. Uh, certainly, uh, More questions? Uh, so I know that the Rutgers Foundation, I think, is one of the widest kind of areas across the United States. And that's why I think it's one of the most important and successful. Um, have you guys been in contact with the MBTA to kind of advise that path so it's not an elevated turnaround to get to the track? Well, we, we have been in conversations with the MBTA. Um, they are very supportive of Northeastern's plans. They would love Northeastern to kind of, you know, uh, maybe contribute to the maintenance and upkeep of Ruggles in a way maybe make some improvements there. We're not being so bold as to change the infrastructure, the transportation. I think that's probably sacrosanct. The MBTA is planning on expanding the length of the commuter rail platform, which will allow, I think, inbound and outbound trains to stop at the same time. Um, and that's something that will require cooperation. Northeastern's actually, the T will take a bit of land from Northeastern. So there's certainly a coordinated effort, but the T is, you know, an agency that is really looking to cooperate in this. Northeastern sort of helping out. All right. Well, then we're going to finish here. And thanks again. Thank Patrick. you.